Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the podcast. And today, I'm going to go my review of AEW's World's End. Starting off the evening, we go to our first match on the main card. It is Brody King teaming up with Jay Lethal, Roosh, and Jay White versus Claudio Castanoli, Mark Briscoe, Daniel Garcia, and Brian Danielson. Uh, number one, this was a good match. Uh, pretty much, this match was pretty much put together. To me, in my opinion, based upon the people that were a part of the Continental Classic Tournament that unfortunately did not make it to the finals. And they throw, you know, they pretty much threw all these guys together in a eight-man tag team matchup. Uh, Roosh and Claudio then both exchanged in the middle of the ring. Danielson then attempts a bell lock on Jay. Danielson then hits a hurricanrana off the top. Danielson then lands multiple yes kicks. Brody King then hits a boss man slam on Garcia in the middle of the ring. Briscoe then hits an enziguri on Lethal. And then Briscoe hits a blockbuster off the apron on Lethal to the outside. Claudio then hits a giant swing. Lethal then applies a figure four leg lock on Garcia, but Mark Briscoe hits a froggy bow. And Garcia then hits a roll up on Jay Lethal. Pins for the three. And your winner of the match is Daniel Garcia. Hats off to Daniel Garcia for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is Miro versus Andrade El Idolo. Um, I thought this was a really good match. Uh, Back and forth matchup between Miro and Andrade with Miro keeping the pace of the match. Andrade and Miro then both exchange in the middle of the ring with Andrade hitting a flying elbow on Miro in the middle of the ring. Andrade then hits a moonsault to the outside taking out Miro. Miro then gets up, applies an accolade on Andrade in the middle of the ring, but Andrade breaks the hold. Andrade then hits a spinning back elbow on Miro for a near fall. Andrade then hits, applies a figure four leg lock, but the hold is broken. Lana then stops Andrade from the figure eight. Andrade looks confused. Miro then with a kick on Andrade. And then Miro applies another accolade on Andrade. Andrade taps out, and your winner of the match is Miro. Hats off to Miro for getting the win in that matchup. Um, One of the biggest things I want to say about this match, um, obviously if you guys don't know by now, um, according to multiple sources, and even, I believe, Tony Khan, this was actually Andrade's last match with AEW, unfortunately. Uh, his contract was coming up. He did not re-sign with AEW. Uh, and for what I understand, there's a lot of speculation that Andrade finished up with AEW and that he will be back on WWE television. There's a lot of speculation that he might actually be on Monday Night Raw tonight. So, again... You know, it was great to see Andrade in AEW. It's unfortunate that, you know, Tony Khan and AEW didn't do that much with Andrade. I think Andrade's a underrated talent. Um, I just think that AEW kind of dropped the ball with Andrade. And unfortunately, Andrade, you know, did not re-sign with AEW and it's most likely going back to WWE. But again, hats off to Miro for getting the win in that matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is for the AEW Women's Championship. It is Rio versus Tony Storm. I thought this was a really good match. Uh, Back and forth matchup between Rio and Storm. Storm was keeping the pace throughout the match. Storm then throws Rio off the apron. Looked absolutely brutal. Storm then applies a Texas Cloverleaf on Rio in the middle of the ring. Referee then throws out Luther for interference in this matchup. Rio then gets up, hits a Hurricane Rana on Tony Storm, as well as a crossbody off the top rope. Rio then hits a snapdragon suplex on Tony Storm for a near fall, but Storm quickly gets up, hits a Storm Zero on Rio for a near fall, but Storm ultimately hits the finish on Rio, pins her for the three, and your winner of the match and still AEW Women's Champion is Tony Storm. Hats off to Tony Storm for getting the win in this matchup. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is Swerve versus Dustin Rhodes now. There was a lot of things going on about this match. Uh, Originally, it was supposed to be Swerve versus Keith Lee. Unfortunately, pretty much the day day of the event, Keith Lee was actually not medically cleared uh, to wrestle Swerve. Supposedly, uh, Keith Lee has been dealing with injury since 2022. uh, And he was finally not medically cleared to have this match against Swerve at World's End. So Dustin Rhodes was kind of a filler for this match against Swerve. Uh, The match itself, it was an okay match um, at best. Uh, Swerve was pretty much keeping the pace throughout the entire match. Uh, Prince Nana brings out a cinder block. Swerve then hits a foot stomp on Dustin Rhodes using the cinder block. 
Dustin Rhodes looked like he's injured his foot or ankle. Dustin then was going to pretty much be taken back with the medical staff back to the uh, backstage area, but Dustin turns around, goes back into the ring, hits a Canadian Destroyer on Swerve, as well as a power slam for a near fall. Rhodes then hits a pile driver on Swerve, and then Rhodes hits a crossroads for a near fall, but Swerve hits another Swerve stomp, pins for the three, and your winner of the match is Swerve. A uh, couple things I'm going to say about this match, man. Number one, uh, I, you know, to me, I don't know why this match was booked between Rhodes and Swerve. Um, I appreciate the fact that Rhodes wanted to step in uh, to have a match for, you know, obviously World's End. Or at least give Swerve a match for World's End because, you know, he's originally booked for a match with Keith Lee. Um, but this was a filler match. I, you know, to me, there was, this match shouldn't even been on the main card, to be honest with you. Not taking anything from Dustin or Swerve. You know, I remember after the match, Swerve was kind of, you know, Swerve looked pissed off. I mean, he looked like he, you know, felt like his time was being wasted. And um, I agree with him. I, I do. I think Keith Lee and Swerve is a great match. But, I, I, you know, to me, in my opinion, the whole Keith Lee thing and Swerve, I feel like it's a day late, dollar short. You know, this is a storyline that has been going on for a while. They stopped the storyline between Lee and Swerve. Swerve, obviously, you know, his career has taken off with great matches against Adam Page and, you know, obviously being a part of the Continental Classic Tournament where Keith Lee has kind of taken a back seat uh, within AEW, even in Ring of Honor. So, you know, this match with Dustin, yeah, was it a waste of time, in my opinion, for Swerve? Yeah, I think it was one of the, you know, not a bad showing by Swerve, but it wasn't one of the best matches I've seen from Swerve uh, since he's been with AEW. I think this match was not needed, nor should it have been booked, in my honest opinion. But hats off to Swerve for getting the win in that match, and hopefully we will see Swerve versus Keith Lee. But, again, how much are we truly going to be invested in seeing Keith Lee and Swerve again um, after the storyline's pretty much been nothing for a while between Lee and Swerve because they all, you know, Swerve's been doing his own thing. So... Uh, we'll look forward to that, but again, hats off to Swerve for getting the win over Dustin Rhodes at World's End. Uh, moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is Chris Jericho teaming up with Sammy Guevara, Darby Allen, and Sting versus Ricky Starks, Big Bill, Takeshita, and Powerhouse Hobbs. Uh, the match itself, it was a good match, a uh, back-and-forth matchup between both teams. Jericho and Takeshita then both exchanged in the middle of the ring with Darby hitting a code red for a near fall. Takesha then hits an avalanche blue thunder bomb off the top rope. It looked absolutely brutal. Sting then hits a stinger splash on Ricky Starks and Takesha. Jericho then gets involved in the match by hitting a code breaker in the middle of the ring. Sting then applies a scorpion death lock on Takesha. Ricky then hits a spear that looked absolutely brutal. Guevara then hits a GTH on Rick, uh, Ricky Starks. And then Guevara hits a shooting star press. Pins for the three. And your winners of the match are Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, Darby Allen, and Sting. Hats off to Jericho, Guevara, Allen, and Sting for getting the win in this matchup. Um, moving on from that, we're going to our next match of the night. It's for the TBS Championship. It is Julia Hart versus Abaddon. Um, I thought it was an okay matchup. Uh, back and forth matchup between Julia Hart and Abaddon. Julia Hart was keeping the pace throughout the match. Sky Blue gets involved by attacking Abaddon. The referee was distracted, which allowed Julia Hart to hit the moonsault off the top rope on Abaddon. Pins her for the three. And your winner of the match and still TBS champion is Julia Hart. Hats off to Julia Hart for getting the win in that matchup and retaining the TBS championship. Uh, moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is a no disqualification match for the TNT championship. It is Adam Copeland versus uh, Christian Cage. I thought this was a great match. A uh, great storyline between uh, Copeland and Christian. Uh, it was a back and forth matchup. Copeland was pretty much keeping the pace throughout the entire match. Uh, Christian then hits Adam with a kendo stick. Copeland then pulls out a ladder. Crowd goes crazy. Chance TLC. Christian then hits a sunset flip powerbomb on Copeland for a near fall. Christian then brings out a table. Copeland then hits an impaler on Christian with a chair. Copeland then hits a spear through a table on Christian. Copeland, uh, Wayne, Nick Wayne then attacks Copeland. Christian then hits a kill switch on Copeland for a near fall. Christian then sets the table on fire. Copeland then power bombs Nick Wayne through the table, which he actually had to reignite because the original flame that Christian had set the, the table on actually went out. So 
Copeland set the, uh, the, the table back on fire, hit a devastating powerbomb on Nick Wayne, even though the table did not break. Copeland then hits a kill switch on Christian, pins him for the three, and your winner of the match and new TNT champion is Adam Copeland. After that, kill switch is here, a.k.a. Luchasaurus. Kill switch then hits a choke slam on Copeland. Kill switch then goes for, uh, gives Christian his TNT opportunity that he won uh, prior to the main card. He actually was a winner of the 20-man battle royal, and the winner of that battle royal will, will receive an opportunity against the TNT champion anytime, anyplace. Uh, Christian pretty much argues with Killswitch. Uh, Killswitch gives uh, Christian his TNT opportunity. Christian then cashes in. Christian quickly hits a spear on Copeland, pins him for the three, and your winner of the match and new TNT champion is Christian Cage. Christian Cage is now the new TNT champion. Moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is the Continental Classic Finals. It is Eddie Kingston versus John Moxley for the Triple Crown. The New Japan Strong Openweight Champion and the Ring of Honor World Championship, as well as the Continental Championship, is all on the line in this matchup. Uh, the match itself was a great match. Uh, great momentum for Eddie Kingston. Back and forth matchup between Kingston and Moxley. Kingston and Moxley then both exchange. Kingston then hits an enziguri on Mox. Moxley then hits a pile driver for a near fall on Kingston. Kingston then gets up, hits an exploder suplex on Moxley. Kingston then hits a Northern Light Bomb on Moxley for a near fall, but then Eddie Kingston hits a spinning back fist on John Moxley, pins him for the three, and your winner of the match and the winner of the Continental Classic Tournament is Eddie Kingston. Now he is the Triple Crown Champion, and hats off to Eddie Kingston for getting the win in that match. Uh, moving on from that, we go into our next match of the night. It is the main event of World's End. It is MJF defending the AEW World's Championship against Samoa Joe. Uh, number one, the intro that was for MJF was absolutely awesome. Uh, MJF then brings out Adam Cole for this matchup. He is ringside. Uh, the match itself was a really good match. Uh, back and forth matchup between MJF and Joe. Joe was keeping the pace throughout the match. Joe then hits an enziguri on MJF, as well as a mustard, uh, muscle, mustard, muscle buster off the apron. MJF then hits a uh, heat seeker on Joe for a near fall. Referee is down. MJF then is looking for the dynamite diamond ring. Cole said he doesn't have it. Joe then applies a submission hold on MJF. And then the referee sounds for the bell. And your winner of the match and new AEW world champion is Samoa Joe. After that, the henchmen surround the ring. Henchmen then attack MJF and Cole. The lights go out. And then Cole is shown sitting in a chair surrounded by the henchmen. Cole reveals to MJF that he is the devil. He reaches into his jacket, pulls out the devil's mask. And after that, the henchmen unmask themselves. And the henchmen are none other than Roderick Strong, Mike Bennett, Matt Taven, and Wardlow. Big shocker to a lot of people that Cole was the person behind the devil's mask. Couple things I want to say about Warlow, man. Let's start with Adam Cole. Adam Cole, this was something that I mentioned now for quite a while, multiple weeks, month now. And I was right. You know, to me the storyline fit perfectly with, you know, Adam Cole being the person behind the devil's mask. I mean the name of the pay-per-view just fit World's End, you know, MJF's world's coming to an end. He's going to lose the Triple B. He's going to realize that his best friend, his bro Chacho, Adam Cole, is going to turn his back on MJF, and Cole is going to be now the one of the biggest heels in AEW. Um, now, I will say this as well. Was it kind of something that, you know, as you watch the weeks on in with this storyline with the Devil's Mask, you can kind of start to see who the persons, you know, who the people might be behind the Devil's Henchmen, uh, with being Roddy, Taven, Bennett, and Wardlow. Speaking of Wardlow, I mentioned multiple things about Wardlow. You know, Wardlow to me was on the short track list to WWE. I, I still still have a belief that Wardlow will eventually join WWE at some point. Uh, with Wardlow being a part of the Devil's Henchmen, I think this kind of saves Wardlow's career. In my honest opinion, look, if you're a Wardlow fan, I'm just trying to keep it uh, real with y'all, man. I think Wardlow, this is the best for his career right now to be a part of this stable a part of the storyline with, you know, the Devil's Henchmen and uh, Adam Cole. I think, you know, this really does save Wardlow's career. Uh, Adam Cole, and, and that's the other thing too, man. Adam Cole, again, one of the best heels in the business. 
this hum- this is humanely going to put Cole over. I, I still believe Cole is injured, um, but hopefully we see him sometime soon back in the AEW ring. Um, but my other thing about the Devil's Henchman is, I believe it was the last attack. There was a lot more people than, you know, the four people that they shown being a part of the Devil's Henchman. So th- this could be an opportunity that they can bring in other talent. Uh, I know Kyle O'Reilly is hopefully coming uh, coming back to AEW here soon. This is another great way to bring in Kyle O'Reilly on his return to AEW. And who knows, this might bring in some other free agents to be a part of this uh, stable with Adam Cole. So who knows? You know, it's pretty much the kingdom reunited once again, especially with, you know, Strong, Cole, Matt Haven, and Mike Bennett. Um, and I think it's great. I, I think this, it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, storyline right now in AEW. It finally came to fruition. And again, it was Adam Cole was the mastermind behind the person wearing the devil's mask and the mind games for MJF. Um, World's End as a whole, was it completely bad? No. I think there were some matches on here that you really couldn't sink your teeth into. Prime example, the women's matches on the main card. Tony Storm, Rio, Julia Hart, and Abaddon. Let's start with Rio and Tony Storm. I think Tony Storm has done some of the best work of her entire career with this timeless Tony Storm character. And I mentioned that multiple times now, uh, when it pertains to Tony Storm. And in my honest opinion, Tony Storm is carrying that women's division on her back. Um, and it's not completely her fault. Uh, but there's no investment into the women's roster on AEW. And there's been a lot of speculation and storylines going on. I know a lot of people are talking about the Chris Jericho situation with Kylie Ray, and it's a serious situation and needs to have a lot of attention on that situation. Uh, right now, there's no other, from what I understand, there's no more details that are coming out. I know it has a lot to do with Jericho and NDAs and stuff like that. And there was a situation, a possible situation between Chris Jericho and Kylie Ray. Now, if you guys don't know who Kylie Ray is, she was with AEW for a short amount of time in the very beginning of AEW. And obviously, back in the day, AEW had a lot of talent that is no longer there. Guys like Joey Janela, Jimmy Havoc, um, you know, Marco Stunt, guys like that that, you know, are no longer with the company. Um, but it's, it looks like it's a serious situation with Jericho and this whole thing going on with Kylie Ray and stuff like that. And that, it needs to be, um, it needs to be figured out 100%. Um, to me, with this information coming out, you know, earlier the day before World's End, I don't even know if Jericho should have really truly been booked on this card for World's End, in my opinion. Until you figure out what's going on, you do an investigation on what really happened between Jericho and Kylie Ray. I don't think Jericho should have been on the card at World's End. And he was getting booed a lot. And, you know, right now no one knows really what's going on. You know, the only thing that I know personally from the people that I talk to is that it has a lot to do with Jericho and an incident with Kylie Ray that happened backstage at an AEW event, and and a lot of information about these NDAs, these non-disclosal agreements that Jericho had people sign, and so on and so forth. So that's the only information that I have about the situation with Jericho right now. But uh, speaking of the topic, yeah, it needs to be investigated to see what Jer- what's going on with Jericho, and you know, hopefully Tony Khan and AEW kind of figure out what it, you know what the hell is going on. Uh, with this, you know, serious situation with Chris Jericho. So, uh, again, we'll stay tuned to see what happens with Chris Jericho moving forward. Um, Julia Hart. Again, Julia Hart is another person I have a lot of praise for. I think Julia Hart has a very high ceiling in AEW where I think Abaddon does not. And I said that from the very beginning when it pertains to Abaddon. I just think the character doesn't fit. There's really not much I feel like they can do with Abaddon. And, and let's face facts, man. I mean, Tony Khan... And AEW are really, truly not invested in the women's division. It's just, it's progressively being shown week after week after week, pay-per-view after pay-per-view after pay-per-view. There's no real build. There's no storyline. There's no, really, truly nothing you can really sink your teeth into and get invested when it pertains to the women's you know division in AEW. And that's why I mentioned earlier about Tony Storm is that she is carrying this women's you know division on her back, and she's doing a hell of a job by doing it. Uh, Julia Hart, again, is is right up there with, to me, like Tony Storm. Julia Hart is really coming into her own. She has a lot of fans behind her. Um, and she's really coming into her own, especially teaming up with Sky Blue. Sky Blue, this also benefits her as well. Um, you know, but I, you got to ask yourself this question. What's next for Julia Hart? You know, who's going to come out the, you know, the woodworks to challenge her? Is Tony Khan AEW possibly bringing in more female talent to the roster? Who knows? I mean, my thing with, you know, Tony Khan and AEW 
You can bring in any female talent that you want, but if you're not going to build storylines around this talent, especially when it pertains to the women's locker room, is it truly going to matter? Because the fans really, it's hard as a fan to be invested um, in, the, in the matches for the women on AEW because there's no storyline. There's no, you know, stuff being built up leading up to this matches up in these pay-per-views. It just, there's no storyline being built around the women. And it's a shame. It really is. Uh, because Tony Storm, like I said, has done some of her best work in her career being timeless Tony Storm. Julia Hart's doing a fantastic job carrying the TBS championship. You know, and there's a lot of women on AEW right now that deserve to have storylines. Britt Baker's another one. Britt Baker's been on TV for a while. Uh, Chris Statlander needs, you know, storylines, stuff like that. Willow Nightingale, she's doing a fantastic job. I think Tony Khan needs to put a little bit more investment into the women's division on AEW because it's lacking. And it's a shame because there's really no storylines wrapped around, you know, the women's division in AEW besides maybe Tony Storm and this Mariah May a situation that's going to be a slow storyline, slow build up to a possible match between uh, Tony Storm and Mariah May, leading probably sometime happening sometime this year. So that's about it for the women's division as far as storylines are concerned. Uh, Dustin Rhodes' swerve, I mentioned this earlier. It was a decent match, but I still honestly believe this match should not have been booked. Uh, Dustin Rhodes was pretty much a filler for this match due to the fact that Keith Lee was not medically cleared to compete that night at World's End against Swerve. Uh, but my, you know, my opinion about this still remains the same when it pertains to Keith Lee and Swerve. Look, I got a lot of praise and a lot of praise for Swerve. I think Swerve is severely underrated. I think Swerve will be AEW World Champion in 2024, uh, especially with Samoa Joe now becoming the new World Champion. Uh, world Champion, it leaves a lot of you know opportunities open for a lot of other talent right now because MJF, you know, you at the time you didn't really see MJF losing that belt because a lot of you know, fans were behind MJF, and it was just, you know, the best thing going for AEW. Uh, but I can 100% see Swerve be world champion in 2024. Swerve is underrated. He's a great talent. Um, he's got a lot of fans behind him. Every time his music hits, when he comes out to the ring, the fans are just going insane. And he's he's a hell of an athlete, and he's a hell of a wrestler. So I, I completely see Swerve being AEW world champion in 2024, and I'm definitely looking forward to that. But uh, I agree with what Swerve said, whether it was, you know, Storyline based or a shoot, you know, he it felt like he was really pissed off that his time was being wasted in this match with Dustin Rhodes. The match shouldn't have been booked, period. Dustin Rhodes doesn't fit in the storyline, and honestly, I, to me, Swerve deserved better than Dustin Rhodes. Not knocking Dustin Rhodes, he's a great talent, Hall of Famer, but there's no storyline there with Dustin and Swerve, in my honest opinion. Uh, you know, and I, t- I talked about Chris Jericho in that situation again. Only information I have about Jericho, from what I've been told, is, like I said, there was a situation that possibly had happened between Jericho and Kylie Ray that happened backstage at an AEW event, and there was some conversations about NDAs and stuff like that, and the situation between Jericho and Kylie Ray is a various, very, very serious situation, and like I said, hopefully AEW uh, do their investigation with uh, the situation and figure out what really is going on with Jericho and you know, get some truth and some light into this uh, serious issue with Jericho. And hopefully, you know, hopefully AEW does the right thing. And, you know, hopefully we see what really happened between Jericho and Kylie Ray. Uh, but my opinion with that situation is, you know, even though we don't have the actual facts of what happened, I think it would have really benefited Tony Khan and AEW not to book Jericho uh, on that, you know, World's End pay-per-view on Sunday, Saturday night. Um, and, and honestly, you know, there was even people saying that Darby Allen was kind of pissed off as well. It seemed like a lot of people were kind of standoffish with Jericho throughout that match. So, um, to me, in my opinion, I probably wouldn't have booked Jericho on that card until you do an investigation to figure out what happened between Chris Jericho and Kylie Ray. Um, Miro and Andrade. Let's talk about that briefly. Uh, again, great match between Miro and Andrade. But like I told you guys earlier, this was Andrade's last match. Andrade did not re-sign a contract with AEW or a contract extension. And uh, from what I've been told, Tony Khan has even mentioned that you know Andrade did not re-sign a contract and he is now a free agent. And like I told you guys earlier, most likely Andrade will show up on WWE television, whether it's tonight for Monday Night Raw or possibly SmackDown. I think Andrade would fit great over in SmackDown, to be honest with you. Uh, or if there's a, a way that he can, you know, 
work with uh, Selena Vega. You know, Selena Vega really helped Andrade in his early WWE career, especially in NXT. He was, she was kind of the mouthpiece for Andrade. So, um, you know, I could definitely see Andrade returning to WWE, possibly for SmackDown. If not, he can show up for Mon- Monday Night Raw because Monday Night Raw supposedly have, you know, their day one Monday Night Raw tonight to bring in the new year. Supposedly it's a stacked show. You know, there's supposed to be some returns. And there was even a rumor that Stone Cold Steve Austin might also be on the show tonight for Monday Night Raw. So... If you guys are uh, big Monday Night Raw fans, you might want to tune in tonight because you might see Steve Austin tonight, possibly Andrade, and some other stuff that might ha- might happen on Monday Night Raw. Um, but all in all, man, World's End was not a bad pay-per-view. When it comes down to brass tacks, it was not a bad pay-per-view. But there was some, the way they did the match order, I wasn't a big fan. Uh, the eight-man tag team champions, uh, eight, tag team champions, the eight-man tag team matchup with pretty much all the contestants that did not make it to the finals in the Continental Classic Tournament. Did we really need that match? No. I don't think that match should have been booked at all. Uh, it was a decent match with, obviously, Daniel Garcia coming out victorious in that mat- uh, matchup. Uh, but it was one of those matches that really didn't need to happen. In my honest opinion, it's kind of the same way I feel about Dustin Rhodes and Swerve. Uh, again, Miro versus Andrade, solid match, but it was all ultimately Andrade's send-off. Um, you know, I, again, I touch bases on the uh, Jericho situation. And the fact that I, in my opinion, I don't think Jericho should have been booked in that match for World's End until they figured out and did an investigation of what, you know, the situation was between Jericho and Kylie Ray. Um, so for that, I think Tony Khan kind of dropped the ball uh, dropped, dropped the ball on that when it pertains to Jericho. I think he should have pulled Jericho from the match. And Tony Khan and AEW should have did an investigation on what really happened between Jericho and Kylie Ray, in my opinion. But again, that's just my opinion. Um... Tony Storm, again, fantastic job. Julia Hart did a fantastic job. But all in that, I'm not going to sit here and say that this was the best pay-per-view of AEW all year 2023. I'm not going to sit here and say that, in my opinion. I, To me, ultimately, I think, you know, besides the main event and getting the reveal of the person behind the devil's mask, you know, I don't think the pay-per-view was, I mean, the all-time greatest AEW pay-per-view of all time, no. I don't believe in that at all. Um... Uh, to me, in my honest opinion, the, th- the top three matches towards the end of the night were probably the best matches on the card. Um, again, happy for Eddie Kingston. You know, Eddie Kingston, this whole Continental Classic tournament, man, he was facing adversity, especially due to the fact that he was putting up his t- uh, championship belts on the line in this tournament to crown uh, a triple crown champion. And uh, he ended up pulling it, uh, pulling it off and, uh, you know, retaining his New Japan Strong Openweight Championship as well as the Ring of Honor World Championship and now the Continental Champion as well. Eddie Kingston is now a Triple Crown Champion, which is absolutely awesome. Well-deserved for Eddie Kingston. And uh, sky's the limit for Eddie Kingston. And I hope, hopefully we see what happens next with Kingston, man. Who is he going to defend that Continental Classic Championship against? Or all three belts, for that matter. Uh, And obviously, you know, Adam Cole. Adam Cole was a big part of World's End. And like I told you guys now, for about a month now, that... My opinion, the devil was Adam Cole, and I was 100% correct. Does this fit the storyline? And then we get the reveal of the devil's henchmen being Roderick Strong, Mike Bennett, Matt Taven, and Wardlow. So definitely look forward to what's going to happen next with Cole and how the storyline might you know fold out with him and MJF. I know a lot of people right now as well, it was kind of speculated and rumored that MJF is not a part of AEW's roster page. I got that information this morning as well when I woke up this morning. Um... And I wanted to talk briefly about that situation as well. At the end of the day, man, I think, and I mentioned this before when MJF was, you know, supposed to be hitting the free agent market. Uh, I'll just say this. Do I think, I'd be very surprised if MJF walks away from AEW. I think secretly he had signed a contract extension with Tony Khan um, behind closed doors. And uh, if he didn't, if, if Tony Khan miraculously did not sign MJF to a contract extension or a new contract, uh, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes uh, Tony Khan's ever done. You can't have a guy like that or afford a guy like that to walk away from your company because it could cripple that company. Guys like that, you know, yeah. For what MJF's done, especially in 2023, you can't afford to lose a guy like that. Um, so I think it's something where they're going into the new year. Maybe it's storyline based leading into maybe this week's Dynamite where MJF shows up and says that he re-signed. I know MJF is looking for some time off. I know he was injured even in the match against Samoa Joe. And obviously MJF needs some time off and well-deserved. I mean, MJF has really, you know, 
done a lot of work with AEW in 2023, and obviously, you know, having this injury and not really taking time off to heal this injury, um, you know, I just think it's time that he takes some time off. Um, but again, who knows, man? I mean, that's the, that's the crazy thing about professional wrestling. I know a lot of free agents are free agents currently right now. Uh, I think Okada's a free agent, or at least his free agency is going to begin here soon. Uh, obviously, the free agents that were released from WWE. So there's a lot of things going on going into, obviously, the new year, especially when it pertains to free agents. So who knows? You know, there's also Alex uh, Alexander Hammerstone from MLW. Supposedly, he's a free agent as well. Again, who knows where he's going to show up, whether it's TNA, AEW, WWE. You know, and that's one of the craziest things about pro wrestling, man. You never know who's going to show up, where, or when. So... And obviously one of the biggest free agents right now with Mercedes Monet, where would she show up? Will she show up back in WWE or would she show up in AEW? Who knows? You know, but all in all though, World's End, solid event. Uh, again, I didn't really like the pace of the matches leading up to the three matches towards the end of the night. Um, do I think it was the best AEW pay-per-view of all time? No, but it damn sure was not the worst. Um, and again, there's a lot of things to look forward to, man. What is Adam Cole going to say next now that he has revealed himself as the devil or the person behind the devil's mask? Uh, what would the henchmen say as well? And uh, what's next for Samoa Joe? Who will he defend that championship against for his first title defense with now being the new AEW world champion? But with that being said, man, I'm going to head out of here. This is my review of AEW's world's end. I hope you guys are out there staying safe. Be careful and remember... Stay classic. Peace.